Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you can be also. He wants you to be ready. He could come anytime. We see signs all around us that uh, the time is near, and, and uh, am, I, am I doing something wrong with this microphone? Am I okay here? Okay. And uh, I, I just, I want, I want to tell you that with all of my heart, I, I want to see every person that I know and love, and even those that I don't, it's the heart of God, that they, we would all gather together forever and ever in heaven. When, when, when uh, Jesus came, though, he didn't came just to take away sin and give you a ticket to heaven. He came to be your friend. And he's the perfect friend. He's the only perfect friend. Now, I learned a long time ago from my brother that a person has one real friend, that they're very rich. I was a little boy. I don't know how my oldest brother knew that because he wasn't spiritual, but he was right. I think he had been hurt and found a friend, a friend that would unconditionally love him, that was loyal, that was truthful, that stood by him. His name was Dickie Kaga. He lived two houses up from us, and uh, they're still good buddies my oldest brother Sam and if I could today if I could give you a gift I'd give every one of you at least three really great friends because friends are the best but the problem is is I can't give you to someone else as a friend it's a choice that I make to be someone's friend I can offer myself to be your friend and I would do my best to give you of my life but I've got at least a dozen best friends, a whole bunch of really close friends, and a whole whole host of other really good friends, and a lot of acquaintance type friends that I really care about. Jesus had 12 disciples. I don't know if he was a friend of Judas. I know that Jesus by character was a friend to Judas, but I just don't know what that relationship was like. He was the one, if you hear and don't know, that betrayed Jesus for money when he was taken away to be crucified. But he had, he had 11 others. And Peter, he was a friend that would lay down his life for Jesus. He pulled his sword. He whacked Malchus, uh, Malchus, Malchus his ear off because he was going to fight to the death for Jesus when they went to take him away out of the garden. John declares, I'm his best friend. I'm the beloved John. And I know he had close friends. Jesus did. I think about Jonathan. Jonathan had, David had Jonathan. Jonathan just something struck and they were close and they were very close friends and Paul had Timothy and Elijah had Elisha and 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 throughout scripture you see well there was Paul and Barnabas and 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 they and they kind of had a a a little bit of a ruckus there and didn't agree for a little while but at the end you could tell they were very close of how Paul spoke of his friend and uh, on and on I could go in scripture but you know the value of friend And I hope that you'll learn something this morning on one of our friends and family days. But if I could give you anything today, I I want to give you something. I want you to give, give you the perfect friend who is Jesus. He's the only perfect friend. He will never whisper. He will never tell a secret. He will never betray you. He said, I'll always be with you. He's laid his life down for you. And he loves you. And I want us to sing this first couple of verses of this great hymn of the church. And I want you to consider Jesus as we sing it and think about what a great, perfect friend Jesus is. Because he wants to bring you closer than just to forgive your sin and take you to heaven. He wants to be your friend. And if you already have Jesus as your friend, he wants to give you more. He wants the fullness of the Spirit. He wants you to give you gifts. He wants to shower you. He will be the best friend and will bless you beyond measure. So sing it, will you? What a friend we have in Jesus. Here we go. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear.
have we trials? Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble your Holy Spirit to be strong and take your truth. Jesus, come be the friend to everyone here, we pray, and make that friendship deeper and stronger, more miraculous, eternal, and powerful, we ask, as you shed your powerful grace and spirit upon your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. What a joy it is to come together. There's something about coming together. You are the church. You're the people of God. And those that have Jesus in you, the Holy Spirit that resides inside you. And he wants to lead you into all truth. He wants you to be close to him, near him, empowered by him, powerful in him, through him. There's more that you can experience and know about God than just the surface here. He offers his blood to cleanse your sin. He wants to be a friend, and he is a great friend. Such great things. I think about, you know, some friends that I've had where I, it gave me such confidence. It's just, it's just in the physical realm of the world. Um, you know, when you have a friend that's a big guy that's got muscles that feel like rocks, when you walk by them, you go like going... No fear, man, no fear. Well, Jesus has got all of this stuff going, man, on every side. He is amazing. You know, Romans 10, 5, 10 says, for since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we certainly, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. Look at that. Since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, Jesus, he restored friendship with God. You see, sin is a barrier between us and God. It breaks relationship. When the Bible talks about death, it's talking about separation from God. It's not talking about a physical death that we all experience, but it's talking about eternal separation from God. Sin keeps us from being able to have relationship, hearing God's voice, walking with God. And when Jesus came, he died for that sin and removed that sin so there's nothing between us and God. And by God's grace and mercy because of his forgiveness, now we can hear God, we can talk to God, we can have confidence in God, we can approach the throne of God, the very throne room of God, through the grace of Jesus with the confidence that God has invited us there because Jesus has taken the sin, removed it, and says, come on, boy, I love you just like you are. I know you're not perfect, but come on and walk with me and follow me and I'll teach you some things and I'll change you and I will empower you and I will make you see life differently through the eyes of faith and by the Spirit and I'll have you feel about things like I feel because let me tell you, God feels perfectly in his love. He cares about you. He's an emotional God. He talks about being like a mother for over his children. Oh, God loves you so much. Pastor Jeff... It was, so it talks about certainly be saved. I want to talk about that verse a little bit more. We will certainly be saved through the life of his son. Jesus is alive because he lives, we too live, and we will be saved. Saved from what? Eternal separation from God. Saved from the penalty of sin. Saved from the power of sin. To be free from sin. To not be weaklings. To not be conquered by sin because we're not. We are the children of God, overcomers, victorious in Jesus Christ. We're not to be little lazy, wobbling along, weakling things because we have Jesus, the greatest friend beside us, above us, around us, in us, his spirit, he's there. 
And we have no excuse. We have all of God. He wants to give it all to us, and that's what he's here to do. So if he's already your friend, take his gifts. Open up. He will pour more of his spirit, more of his giftings through you. He wants to make you a powerful person to walk with God. See, Pastor Jeff preached pretty good last week on family. No one's amen. Whoa, 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 whoa. That was a joke. Pretty good. He preached great on family. Okay, wait a minute. He also showed his picture 19 and a half years ago when he started. Now, I founded this church 26 years ago. And I want you to know, when I was 38, I haven't changed a bit. I look just like I did then. I don't need to show you a picture of what I looked back like that back then. You just look right here. Now, that's either oh, oh my or oh me. I don't know what. If you believe that, I got some swamp land in Florida. But he preached about how he spoke of marriage and how to make it great. Mm-hmm. That's not always easy, is it? He said, marriage is it's not about finding the perfect mate, but being the perfect mate. So Susan, wherever you are in here, I want you to know you don't have to worry about being the perfect mate. You found the perfect mate <laughs> right here. It's all yours, baby. Oh, yeah, you got it. You got it made, Susan. And he said... Is there any lightning? <laughs> and, and he said, in our marriages, we need to focus on what you have to give and not what you get when you get married. What you're giving, not what you get. But Susan, you can go on and focus on what you're getting. <laughs> and while you focus on that, I'm really sorry. <laughs> Just want you to know. Well, you live with someone all the time, they know everything about you that's not perfect. And, and I'll tell you, my wife has been gracious and forgiving. She's a, she's a nice, merciful lady. And uh, I, I'm okay most of the time, but boy, sometimes I can be a stinker. How many of you ever met me when I was a stinker? And I'm trying to not let that. I'm try, I'm, I saw that, Nevi Rowe. Okay, put, one of the deacons write her up, will you? Uh, I... I uh, I'm asking Jesus to help me be more constant in his spirit and love and peace and strength. It's an ongoing battle, fighting the battle of the flesh with the spirit, but filling up with Jesus every day is our, is our goal. And uh, so, that, you know, seriously, I don't want to be a taker in marriage or as a friend or anything. I want to be a giver. And what do I have to give to you? Well, I've got love and life and all of that, but the best thing I've got is Jesus. And I know a lot of you have him, but if you don't, I want to give you Jesus. I have a friend for you as a title, and his name is Jesus. You may feel like there's a hole missing. There's some piece of the puzzle of your life. You may have human friends, but there's something in a hole in you, and I'm telling you, Jesus is for you, and he's with you. And that's why he gave his life to you. It, 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 you know, God gave his life, he gave his son, so that you could walk with him and he could be your friend. This is how we should live. This is a great friend verse. It's one of my favorite verses, but it doesn't use the word friend. It's in, it's in if you're taking notes, Ephesians 4, 29 to 32. And um, I'm, I'm gonna read this particular version that I have here, and yours is similar, I know. Let no corrupt, corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only as such as is good for the building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those that hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. He's talking about by what you're saying, by unforgiveness, the harshness. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. By whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Those are things that come to you when you're hurt. You know what marks a Christian? Forgiving and giving. These things will build up in you if you don't give and forgive. You gotta forgive people or else you're not even close to a place where you can be a great friend to somebody or a mate. You've got to let it go. There's been times when I had a hard time letting it go. I held on and I wasn't a nice person because hurt causes you to hurt somebody else and you've got to let it go. If you want to be a friend, let things go. Be kind to one another, 
tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. And this is the attitude we have to have if we want to be a friend. You see, if you're going to pick a human to be a friend to, guess what? You're going to let them down and they're going to let you down. You will not maintain lifelong friendships unless you can maintain this attitude. I mean, if you go into it for them being perfect and everything they're going to give for you or do for you, then you're going to be disappointed. Now, I got, I got a, a lot of friends. I could point, point them out, and there's other, there's levels of friends. There's best friends. I've got lots of best friends. And say, so how can you have a lot of best friends? Well, because they're that level of a friend. The best friend you could have. I got several best friends. So did Jesus. I, I have a lot of really good friends. I've got close friends. I've got acquaintance friends. And I got people that I'm a friend to and I know that care about me because I'm a human being because that's the character they are. And they're a friend to anybody. And that's who Jesus was. And as a believer, that's who we should be, a friend to our neighbor and a friend to those who are even our enemies to love and forgive them and bless them and not, not hate them for what they do to us. That's the words of Jesus. So becoming that model friend is a godly characteristic. However, in your humanity, you're never going to measure up. I just went to Tulsa and buried one of my best friends from when we were little boys, seven or eight years old. And I've never experienced that closeness of someone dying. And I've been grieving deeply. It caught me off guard and didn't realize how deep of a connection there is to someone that you grew up with as a child and you grow old and then they get ALS and die. And so it, it still hits me and I start crying. He knew how to be a friend, that was a mark. He was beyond measure a friend, and we were close. But as followers of Jesus, in friendship, in marriage, in anything, we need to focus on giving and forgiving because that's exactly what God did. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world, that's people that are sinful in the world, not believers, not changed people. He loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him, would not perish, but have everlasting life. They're not going to die. They're going to live forever. God loved us. He gave his best. So friends, people who love, give. They give of themselves, and they forgive. And I want to give you my Jesus, who's the best possible at giving and forgiving. Nobody gives, and nobody forgives like my Jesus. He's the best friend. These principles of family relationship are exactly like that Pastor Jeff taught last week are just like uh, a friendship. My focus shouldn't be on go, uh, who is going to be my friend. My focus isn't like, who here is going to be my friend? I'm, here, you be my friend. It's not that at all. Or what I get, but what I can give and who I'm going to be a friend to. In other words, my responsibility, I'm not called to have friends. I'm called to be a friend to be the best friend anyone could have and treat everyone just like that all the time. It's a choice. You see, when I decide, I'm slow, when I'm gonna make someone my very, very close friend, I will get, they'll be my casual friend, then they'll become a good friend. And I've got someone in this church that I'm about to ask them to be one of my best friends because I verbalize it. People, a lot of people are afraid of that because they're afraid of rejection. Hey, would you be one of my best friends? They say, yes, I'm going to say, well, here's what it requires. It requires what I'm about to preach here, and I'm going to tell them those things. This is what it requires. But then we know it. It's on the table. You're one of my best friends. Proverbs 18, 24 talks about the fact that we have to show ourselves friendly. In the King James, it says, a man that has friends must show himself friendly. In other words, you need to be a friend, not worry about having friends. You're going to have a friend if you give yourself a friend. What you give will come back at you. So if you give yourself a friend, you're going to come back and have a friend. If you're giving, it'll come back at you. It's just the way it is. And there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Well, that's Jesus for sure. That's a God Almighty. And that's what the, we are like Christ. He wants us to be the same way. A gracious, loving, forgiving, merciful person who knows how to be a friend. Let me ask you a question. Does friendship have a high value to you? Where does it, for its values, your friends, how much do you value them? Now, right away in your mind, most of you think, oh, I value my friends hugely. 
But my question is, is does your life that you live bear that out? Does it look like friendship is a high place value? See, most of the world would talk about friends being a high place of order. I didn't know this, but I preached this in the early service, and someone afterwards said to me, it was Danny Phillips, she said to me, hey, there's a book out here that talks about seven things that begin with the letter F that people need and how to prioritize to make sure they're in the right priority. Didn't even know that book existed. This came to me just by the Spirit. Just, it just came to me as I observed life. And so I'm going to share what I have, because I don't know what that book says, but they said I ought to read it. So... The first thing, as far as people that are outside of their faith and friendship with Jesus, uh, the way they approach life, they approach it in this order. The first F is fun. Fun and food. Fun and food and be happy. Fun. We have sports and movies and TV and weekend trips and concerts and theater and amusement parks. The word muse means to think. You muse, you think. Mull. Amuse is not to think. We don't really want to think about eternal life, life and death. We want to amuse ourselves to keep us from thinking about the reality of eternity and value of family and friends and God. We amuse ourselves, camping, vacations, recreations. Bible says in the last days, the men will be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. They will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And their stomachs will be their God. Their food won't be to sustain them, but they will live their life. Everything they're doing about fun, food, enjoyment, and pleasure, and happiness. And Jesus is a part of it all. It says in the last days that people will have a form of religion but denying the power of God. In other words, there's something greater than just a religious service, a religious activity, a religious system, a religious belief, a theology. There's a power of Christ within and His Spirit that's real, that revolutionizes you. It's not a choice and power that's in your own to change you. It is the power of God, His Spirit, to change you, to make you into what God wants you to be. And He wants you to be a great husband, a great wife, a great father, a, a mother, a great grandparent. He wants you you to be a great friend, and he has the power to change you. But too many people pursue fun, food, and happiness. And of course, if that's your number one value, then money has to be there to do all these fun things. So finances, our job, our going after money is something we pursue so we can enjoy that. Our career is a big concern. We work, we work, we work when we should be worshiping. We work when we should be with family. We take on extra jobs. We do things and so that we can, quote, unquote, enjoy life. And we can have fun, 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 fun when the daddy takes a T-bird away. Fun, fun. I don't think that's a word, but something like that. That wasn't in my notes. I'm sorry. <laughs> It's kind of bubbled out. Fun, they put finances next, and then family. Family. Yeah, because it's nice to do fun things with the family when you have plenty of money to make memories, and we want to make memories, and that's okay, because we're all going to eventually die, and memories are good. But perhaps the thought of dying, or that we only have a little while with our family, should also bring up the preparation to die. It also should bring about our eternal destiny. It should also bring up whether we want to see our family again in heaven. So what are we doing? Are we providing fun and finances for our family and experiences and memories and joy? Are we providing Jesus and the deeper eternal things of the Holy Spirit? Are we more concerned about building a fun life for our family or a holy life for our family? Then they We'll put friends next. Well, because it's good to have friends. You like to have fun with your friends, and friends matter, and we, we want to have those friends so we can enjoy life, and, 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 and it's good. That's good. Have fun with them. And a lot of people who put fun first have real friends. I'm not saying they don't. And they love their family. I'm not saying they don't. But it's the pursuit and value that they put in the order. And then, of course, faith gets relegated to the back of the line. It's the last thing, faith. But as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, faith should be first. The word faith, to believe in Jesus, the belief system is a verb that really refers to faith. And the word faith means in the original language to trust and obey. 
It's not just believing in something. You can have all the doctrine right. You can believe everything that's in this book exactly the way God intended it and be lost and empty because it's not theology that saves you. It's not the plan of salvation that changes your heart or comes into your life and abides with you. It's the Christ, the living word, the Jesus, the Christ by his spirit that comes in by his power of grace and revolutionizes you. And faith has to be the first, foremost value Seek first the kingdom of God, the eternal things. The faith is that which money can't buy, valuing things that money can't buy and death can't take away. The invisible things, the eternal things, faith has to be first. Holiness is more important than happiness. What is holiness? It's separated to God. It's saying, I'm God's first. Here I am, God. Not my will. Oh, wait, the Lord's prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom has a will. I want to agree with that will, and then I'm going to see the kingdom will, which has miracles in it, come to pass. And people will see God's glory and power and majesty. May his kingdom come to me personally. And plus, the Bible says more than once in the Old and New Testament repeated, without holiness, no man will see God. And we saw holiness to be separate unto God is in Christ. How do you get there? It's can't, nothing you can do. You can't pull up your boots. It's not an action of being a good boy, a good girl. No, it's saying, Jesus, I need you. Be my friend. Come into my heart. And I'm here to give you my friend Jesus. I have a friend for you. A friend for you. His name is Jesus, God Almighty. Faith must be first, then family. To teach your family to be great in God's kingdom. To value the eternal things. To value the things that money can't buy and death take away. And, and to leave a legacy to your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. To teach faith, to build your family strong in Jesus. And the third thing then becomes friends. Not friends just to party with, but friends to care about their eternal soul because if faith is the first value, the first thing you care about your friends is their spiritual life, their eternity. Do you get that? Not just having a good time and never even asking them, where are you? Are you ready? You see, you have people you work with, the neighbors, that you're maybe the only hand of grace to them. You're the only hand from heaven saying, come to my friend Jesus. And when you have friends, you care about their eternal souls enough to tell them the truth. Listen, even, even if they don't agree. You see, I didn't make up the truth. I just believe what this says. Here's the truth. I believe what I believe because the Bible says this is true. I hope you do too. Friends and finances, yes, then money. Money's not just for fun anymore. We work to bless our family, yes. To help our family, yes. To give to others, yes. To be kind to others. To give to missions, to give to the kingdom of God. To have value of the first fruits to the church. To give the tithes, to give your offerings. To bless people because money now looks different. So how do you know if your value is faith first? Well, look what you do with your money. It's easy, isn't it? Look what you do with your time. What are your values? Should be faith, family, friends, the finances, and uh, not just to have a never-ending party and a weekend, bl weekend blast, and then fun will come. Let me tell you, fun is good. God's not a cosmic killjoy. He likes fun. He says funny stuff. I can tell you, but I'm not going to have time. He does. He, he has some funny things. You know where it says talking about creation, he says, he says, you're but dust. That's funny. In my opinion, that's a funny statement when he says that. Now, I don't think that's what, I don't think why I took this way he meant it, but that's funny. I'm, I'm going to tell you anyway. But you know what? Food is good. Enjoy your food. Be happy. Enjoy memories with your family, with your friends. It's all good, but don't make it your first value. Not, it shouldn't be your number one goal or value. I want to tell you, my, I believe that truly my top three values are faith, family, and friends. If I have a tendency, it's to get family in front of, friend, in front of faith. How many of you maybe that can sometimes be a little issue that you love your family so much because they're tangible that that can become just a little bit more important than faith? Raise your hand. Right? You get that? 
Why do you think Jesus said, don't love your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your children, your wife, or even your own life more than me? In other words, don't put the value of family above faith, above God. You value God. He gave his son for you. Did everybody get this? And this is the order to have happiness. And so we're talking about friends, and I've got a lot of them, but I want you to know literally my only perfect friend is Jesus. Now, Dale Atchison thinks he is my perfect friend. But Madeline reminds him often that he is not. He's not perfect. He doesn't look perfect. He doesn't walk perfect. He doesn't listen sometimes to her. He's a little bit too truthful with the weaver, those types of things. But he is a great friend. He and Madeline, Dale, and Joe, who gave the announcement about the choir, and Harley, who played the drum there, those two couples, along with Linda, who was singing, and just a handful of others, Carrie and Lori and Larry and Lisa, they were here from the beginning helping me, Jerry Sadoff, a few others, and they're all really great friends, but not as great as Jesus, and I have a friend for you, and it's Jesus. The Webster says about friends, it's one attached to another by affection or esteem, that you esteem them, you have affection for them. There's so many of you I esteem highly, I value highly, I have affection for you. When I see you and I look at you, my heart fills up with emotion and with love. You know, love begets love. And so many of you have loved in such a beautiful way, and I know you feel that way about others. So quickly, three things that a friend does. Loyal, he's loyal. You gotta trust a person. Trust their unconditional love. Trust that they would forgive you no matter what you did, that they're gonna be your friend. They're not gonna forsake you. Proverbs 17, 17 in the NIV says, a friend loves at all times that a brother is born for adversity. In the New Living Translation, it says, a friend is always loyal. Loves at all times are loyal, and a brother is born to help in time of need. See, sometimes there's a need that you need a friend, and boy, do we sometimes need a friend. So many times I've called on my friends. Proverbs 20, verse 6, many say they are loyal friends, but who can find one who's truly reliable? I mean in the middle of the night. I mean when something's going on, you say, who can I call? When that name pops in your head, you know you can wake them up. You know you can talk to them. That's that reliable friend that will do anything for you anytime. They'll go out of your way. And that's why my brother said, if you even find one like that, you're rich. But I, I think I've got a lot. I may be a little bit hallucinating right now, but I think I've got a lot of loyal friends, and I'm thankful for every one of them. Also, if you want to be a friend of God, you have to be loyal to God. To be loyal, so what does the Bible say about being loyal to God to show that we're friends of God? Well, James 2, 23 talks about faith. Our trusting and obeying is faith. Now, watch what the words are. And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. He believed God. That's faith, folks. Did he just say, oh, I believe, and didn't do anything? No. That's when he took his son up the hill to sacrifice him because God said, go take Isaac and sacrifice him to me. And he trusted God and was going to do it, but God provided a ram. And Abraham didn't have to take his own son. But he believed God. He acted in faith. He trusted God, though he didn't understand. He obeyed God, and he was called the friend of God. See, he knew something about the character of God when he did that. James 4, 4 talks about this idea of adultery, and he's not talking about with a woman. However, let me just mention that. If Jesus tells a story about a woman caught in adultery, and they're about to stone him, and he goes up and starts writing in the sand, and now says, now those of you that haven't sinned, cast the first stone. They started putting the rocks down and walked away. And he says, they don't condemn you. I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. You see, Jesus loves people in their sin. He loves you, and he gave his life for you. He didn't die for the righteous, otherwise there'd be no need to die. He died because he understands the physical humanity and temptation of man. So he gave his life. So here we go. He says, you adulterers, James 4, 4. You don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. A friend of the world. The world is the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and the lust of the flesh. What I want. Know the words. It's what I said earlier, priorities out of place. Fun matters first. See, finances, 
See what I'm talking about? In other words, selfish. And he's saying, if you're going, to, you're going to have a love affair with this life, with the earthly life, with the temporary pleasures, with the pleasure, the, the food of this life, the pleasure of this life, and I'm just on the side and I don't matter, you're having a love affair with your earthly temporary life and God wants you to live for the eternal things. He says, faith, trust, and obey. And if you're going to be loyal to me, to be my friend, then follow me in faith. And I'm going to tell you, you don't want to be an enemy of God. So turn your heart toward God today. The next thing is a friend is truthful. See, some people are too nice to be truthful or they're too sensitive because they wouldn't want anybody to tell them something that hurt like that. Now, I got friends, I tell them, if they're going to be my friend, one of the things they'll say is, well, now, I need you to commit that anytime you know anything, you need to tell me, you tell me the truth. I don't care how much it hurts because it doesn't do me any good to have a friend unless you'll tell me the truth. Now, Dale, here, I'm going to pick on him again. I think he loves telling me the truth. I mean, he wakes up, what can I tell Weaver the truth today for? You know, well, it's kept me out of some trouble. You know, words can slap you up against the head and thank God for them. Proverbs said this to Solomon, the wise man, Proverbs 27, 5 and 6, an open rebuke is better than hidden love. Look at that. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than kisses from an enemy. I wouldn't want your kisses day, I'll tell you that right now. Thank you for your hidden love, the rebuke, rather, your rebuke that's better than hidden love. Proverbs 27, 9, the heartfelt counsel of a friend is as sweet as perfume and incense. Isn't that beautiful? The heartfelt counsel of a friend. Being truthful, guys. In Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. I did, a, I did kind of a verbal thing this morning, and I was really ridiculed over it trying to make the sound of iron sharpening iron. I'll try it again. They said it sounded like a duck going through some sort of meat grinder. But iron sharpening, I mean, when iron goes iron, I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's putting some, I mean, you can just picture it. That's not, you know, it doesn't sound good. It's, you know, that's tough. But you know what? You're sharpening each other. That's why we got to be in relationship and friendship. And a real friend tells the truth. And lastly, a real friend is sacrificial. Being a good friend sometimes requires sacrifice. It's not convenient. And it surely wasn't for Jesus with his disciples. Here's what he says. And he says it to you, John 15, 13 to 15. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You're my friends if, if you do what I command. There it is. Trust and obey. That's faith. Faith matters first. You're my friends if you do what I command. Jesus said, you say you love me, but you don't obey me. You're like the man that built his house on the sand, and when the storms came, the house came tumbling down. But if you say you love me and you do what I command, then you're like the man that built their house on the rock, and when the winds and the rain came, the house stood. So he says, I know, he tells his disciples, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in slaves. Now you're my friends since I've told you everything the Father told me. Will you bow your head with me? Would you do me a favor and not move for a moment, please? Please don't, don't feel like you have to slip out quick or something. It's such a holy moment. This morning, in the early service, it was a family never been in church ever in their life. Two small children. And they prayed this prayer. A Holy Spirit came upon them and tears ran down their cheeks uncontrollable and they didn't understand, but I had the same experience when I said, Jesus, come into my life. But would you close your eyes to respect your neighbor, every person here, no matter how spiritual you are or not. Just close your eyes to show respect to your neighbor and please stay seated just for a little longer so we don't have a distractions. Is Jesus your best friend? Do you value faith more than friends or fun or even family? What kind of friend are you? And do you have peace that if you were to die, you would be in the forever family in heaven forever and ever with Jesus? Do you have that peace? Do you know for sure that you'd wake up in heaven? Is your family circle, the people you love in your family and your close friends, do they have this gift of friendship of Jesus? 
Will you get to spend eternity with them forever there? Three things. Jesus wants to do more than erase your sins. He wants to be your forever friend and come in and make himself real. And if you ask him, he will. Will you pray with me? Could you all close your eyes, please, and pray? Please, no one looking around. See, God is invisible in this place. I'm a man. To connect to the eternal spiritual things that are eternal and invisible. Close your eyes so the physical doesn't distract you. Jesus, right now, we ask you to forgive my sin. Forgive me for I failed. Forgive me. You're a faithful, loyal, truthful friend. You tell the truth whether I want to hear it or not. You've sacrificed and proved your love by laying down your life on the cross. Forgive my sins and come into my life. Turn my heart toward you. Speak truth to me. Things maybe I've never heard. Would you speak truth and be honest to help me know what you think, the way you see things, the way you feel. I want to be your friend, Jesus. Would you be mine? Come to me even now.